Hey guys, it's Jacob 201 here, and today we are back for part three of our Marvel ranking of the Cosmic Entities, Abstracts, Mystical Gods, and Beyond Omega Level Mutants. Today is where it gets exciting. Now, the other parts are very interesting, and I liked making them. It was hard work, but I liked ranking them and figuring out where they fit. But this is kind of what you really came for. This is the cosmic entities. These are the powerful beings. These are some of the multiversal powers that you've been waiting for. They appear today on this list. These are the beyond, beyond Omega level mutants. And it's going to be a fun ride. So strap in and let's get right into it. So starting off this list at number 39 is the Horde. Now, the Horde is this obscure group in Marvel Comics. There's not much known about them. The only thing known is that they oppose the Fulcrum, which isn't smart, by the way, and they are meant, their sole purpose is to kill Celestials, and they're very good at it. They are essentially just buff Celestials that are able to um, kill Celestials quite easily. Like, if you would were on a contract to kill Celestial, just call the horde the horde are going to be able to do it so that's where they are just just better than the celestials on this list as we ended with the celestials yesterday so that's why they rank right here at number 39 at number 38 we have the many angled ones now if the horde invented killing celestials the angled ones perfected it they killed nearly all the celestials across the multiverse and they are so good at it that they quite literally every celestial feared their coming they were extremely powerful. Uh, the picture shown shows them killing Thanos. They're just very, very powerful. I believe they came from the Cancerverse, although I'm not quite sure. They're extremely powerful creatures, and they are able to kill Celestials easier than the Horde would, I would say. And that's why I placed them one above the Horde right here at number 38. Coming in at number 37, we have another tie between the Mutant and Human Beyonder and Gabriel Shepherds. Now, I hear a lot of hate for Gabriel Shepherds, and a lot of people don't think he's very powerful, but if you look at his raw feats, the dude's absolutely insane. He had enough power to overpower every, almost every powerful telepath in the mutant world back then, right? Excluding, like, Rachel Summers and Nate Gray. And then he also was able to overpower the almost the entire team of X-Men, and was able to avoid every single type of detection known to man, okay? And then, on top of it all, he was so powerful that he said he ascended our reality and went to a higher dimensional plane. And people think he's weaker than Franklin Richards. Now, I, I just don't get it. Um, he, he's ca And then he also shows he's capital, uh, capable of high-level reality warping and time manipulation, able to stop time instantaneously and bring someone back from the dead. So, I think he's very powerful. And then, the reason why he ties with Mutant and Human Beyonder is Mutant and Human Beyonder was shown to be able to do almost everything like that. And the only reason why I kept him up with Gabriel Shepherds is because he is the Beyonder. He's very powerful. I assume he could be a time manipulator. Um, also, it was shown that most of his reality warping tricks were just illusions. So... It's just there's a lot going against the Beyonder and a lot going against Gabriel Shepherds, which is why they meet right here at number 37. At number 36, we have Kubik and the Shaper of Worlds. Uh, now, Kubik and the Shaper of Worlds are in, uh, incomplete sentience of the Cosmic Cube, uh, just like Molecule Man and the Beyonder. However, they never show great feats and treat the other two as if they're kind of more improved versions of what they are. Um, they are both very, very powerful, having the same powers as Beyonder and the um, Incomplete uh, Cosmic Cube Sentient Molecule Man. They have the exact same powers because their power comes from the exact same source. However, they might just have it to a slightly lesser degree. They are both very powerful, and they are actually relatively more peaceful than their other two Incomplete Cosmic Cube Sentient counterparts. So that's why they're right here at number 36. At number 35 is post-retcon Beyonder, and by this, I mean the incomplete Cosmic Cube Sentient Beyonder. Wow, that's a mouthful. Beyonder. Um, because the retcon was is he's no longer the, one of the most powerful beings in the universe. Actually, he's just a failed Cosmic Cube, or I think the word they use is an aborted Cosmic Cube, and that he just has a fraction of the Beyonder's power. This made him marginally weaker 
instead of being one of the most powerful beings in the universe, they even stated one time, I didn't take it as fact, because the facts didn't show it, just a celestial said, we are above the cosmic cube sentient beings, and it's like, what? They just completely nerfed the character, they made him on the level of Kubik and the Shaper of Worlds, except he's slightly more powerful, and that's why he's right here at number 35. Predictably, the most powerful incomplete Cosmic Cube sentient is Mo post retcon Molecule Man. He comes in here at number 34. Now, I want you to notice something. I added the pictures in the frame you're looking at right now. And as you can see, he's wearing kind of this big domed costume. And in the last slide, Beyonder was also wearing a big domed costume. And you'll see them in one of the pictures I put up there. It's them kind of pushing their hands at each other, and it's causing, like, all these side effects around the universe. Not the multiverse, just the universe. And that's actually pl playing homage to a comic that came out 20 years earlier, and it had both of the more powerful pre write conversions in the exact same motion, except instead of being dumb dome-looking ones, they're in kind of soft fabric. And I just want to bring that up, so you can always tell... If it's a post retcon Cosmic Cube Week Beyonder or Molecule Man, if it's either the more detailed, bigger image of them pushing their hands together, or it's their more kind of domey looking costumes. So that's just one thing you should look out for. So, the reason why Molecule Man and Beyonder were fighting is because a being called Cosmos was separated back into her Molecule Man and Beyonder Cosmic Cube counterparts. Because the two had been combined together to form a complete sentient of the Cosmic Cube. Um, so, essentially, Cosmos is the completion of all of the Cosmic Cube power from Molecule Man put into Beyonder. And she is as powerful as both of them combined she has control over like all of reality in a universe and she's extremely powerful uh however she makes some dumb mistakes she becomes mortal in the form of the maker and thanos actually kills her um it's one of the dumbest things they just wanted this character to go away but here she stands at number 33 Number 32 is the first tie between universal powers and those powers are the goblin force and the unipower now the unipower Essentially, uh, comics explained explained it best. It was like the Jason Momoa bodyguards image, where like they're tiny and Jason Momoa towers over them. The unit power essentially protects eternity, but it's like way weaker than eternity. Essentially, it goes on random superheroes and gives them like r makes them really powerful, gives them cosmic awareness, all that good stuff, and it essentially has the power of like one universe or roughly that power. Another entity with roughly one universe worth of power is the Goblin Force. A lot of people confuse the Goblin Force with being stronger than the Phoenix Force. It is not. It devoured one universal portion of the Phoenix Force. The Phoenix Force is multiversal, if that helps you. So, it, it devoured one tiny fragment of the Phoenix Force. So, these two are both roughly a universal power, and so they are essentially the same. Their feats are the, almost the same. Um, they are very similar in almost all of their aspects, so that's why they tie right here at number 32. Ranking in at number 31 is Hyperstorm. Now, Hyperstorm is actually the son of Franklin Richards and Rachel Summers. So, the grandparents would be Jean Grey, Susan Storm, Reed Richards, and Scott Summers. So, as you can tell, um, he's very, very powerful. He's the heir to almost every power in his universe. He's actually from an alternate universe, but essentially, like... When Jean Grey dies, like, he inherits the Phoenix Force, and Rachel Summers, like, he gets the Phoenix Force. He also gets, like, all of Franklin's powers, and all of Rachel Summers, like, reality warping powers. So he essentially, like, rules the entire universe, like, by himself. So he's extremely powerful, and that's why he ranks right here at number 31. Breaking into the top 30 is none other than House of M Scarlet Witch, and that's for one reason... She's the first multiversal level character on this list. Now, the reason for this is because, with her famous words, no more mutants, she was able to wipe out 98% of the mutant population. It was originally thought that she was just altering our universe, but it was later revealed she had wiped out 98% of the mutant population across the multiverse. Which means that she's technically, although weak and uncontrolled, a multiversal reality warper. And she gets her powers from uh, Chathon or Cathon. So that also helps. So that's why she's right here at number 30. Surprisingly, at number 29, we have Size Neg. Now, I know there's a lot of people that are going to say, 
Size Neg created a universe, but that universe happened to be the 616 universe. Therefore, since the 616 universe was the first universe, he created the multiverse. That's not true, actually. The since the 616 is at the center of the universe doesn't mean that whoever created 616 created all the the universes. Okay, that would just that would essentially mean because it was showed that creating one universe requires a certain amount of power. For creating a multiverse, it requires an entire cosmos to die. So I don't believe that just it, by chancing to create the 616 universe, it means that you can create the entire multiverse. I just really can't get on that bandwagon and can't wrap my head around that. So I don't, I don't really think that would apply. It doesn't make sense to me. So instead, he ranks right here for he created an entire universe and was shown to be able to easily defeat Shuma Gorath, who is a interdimensional uh, demon who's very powerful, and he was shown to have likely multiversal levels of power. So that's why he's right here at number twenty-nine. At number 28 is Hunger. Now, Hunger is a multiversal entity that the mere presence of Hunger can actually destabilize the universe as it devours it. However, it is not capable of perfect interdimensional travel by itself, so it has to use people like Galactus to enter a dimension. It can be defeated. Um, it is still very strong. It eats multi. I mean, it eats universes. It is multiversal. And that's why it ranks in right here at number 28. So at number 27, we have the Griever at the end of all things. Now, she can wipe out universes, and she was able to defeat Owen Reese at full power after he had exhausted himself by creating the entire multiverse over again. So she, he, was, uh, he was already completely exhausted, and she used her ship's powers to defeat him. Um, she also defeated Franklin Richards. However, she couldn't defeat Reed Richards when he was standing right in front of her because she didn't have her ship. Because essentially, she described it that her ship allows her to essentially sanitize the table. The table is the universe, but like a single bacteria is hard to do. So like just one Reed Richards. So when she tried to get back to her ship, the Fantastic Four sabotaged it, and then she couldn't leave. She accepted defeat and she moved on. So that's why she ranks it right here at number twenty-seven. I bet some people were expecting to see Legion on the list, but I bet some people didn't expect to see him so far up. But in fact, at number 26, I have Legion. Now, Legion actually is much more powerful than anyone gives him credit for. If you look, when he's able to harness all of his personalities at once, he's easily a multiversal being. So, he created his own pocket universe while using his most powerful personality, with, which has the power to reality warp. And he was able to create his own splinter timeline with the other personality, Time Sync. He's also able to drain and steal powers with another one of his personalities. So, with all of them combined, he would easily be able to form his own universes and all that crazy stuff, which is why it lands him on position right here at number 26. At number 25, we jump into our very, very powerful multiversal friend, Majim Jaspers from Earth 616. His, his reality warp is so powerful, it could expand from universe to universe and corrupt eternities and place him as the sole head of that universe and go on and go forth and, and in, in fact, infect the entire multiverse. Now, I say there's no way he could affect the rest of the Omniverse, as the Omniverse is everything, like, DC Comics, the Friends Universe, Star Wars, like, every entertainment ever. I don't- he's not that powerful. I just refuse to admit it. And he was actually beaten by just putting him in a place where he couldn't manipulate reality, seeing that he actually needed reality to manipulate. But the way that he's actually above reality warpers as a matter manipulator is because of his just his ability. He's so strong. He was able to destroy. They had to destroy an entire universe just to stop a weaker version of him from another universe. In 616, he was so madly powerful that they had to design a robot to drop him in the dead earth where the other one was. And he's still alive. He's still there. He's just can't hurt anyone. That's how madly powerful Mad Jim Jaspers is, and that's why he ranks in right here at number 25. At number 24, coming in just above Mad Jim Jaspers is Abraxas. He was stated to be the antithesis to eternity, able to collapse universes just with his mere presence. He was also able to kill Galacti easily, 
Although it took Hunger a while, he's able to just instantly make Galactuses appear dead, and he kills them across the universe in an extremely powerful and commanding fashion. He was only defeated when the ultimate nullifier was pulled on him, and when Galactus threatened him and said that he would destroy him if he didn't leave, to which he left. So that's the end of Abraxas, and that his extreme shows of power is why he ranks it at number 24. At number 23, we have one of my favorite characters in all of Marvel Comics, and that is Clyde Winsham, the Marquis of Death, or Marquis of Death. Um, he is extremely powerful. He waved his hand and destroyed universes easily. He, he, he destroyed most of the multiverse and went to Earth-616 and was defeated only by Doctor Doom, who he sent back in time, was eaten by a megalodon shark, was horribly scarred, and then found the Marquise of Death, and was able to gain full power. He showed feats such as creating an entire life for Doom to live out in less than a second, and that's by his apprentice. The Marquis of Death himself is far more powerful than his apprentice. The only way they could beat him was by using the apprentice, which was Doctor Doom, and a version of himself from the past. He was like, oh my gosh, I love the Marquis of Death. He's such an interesting character. But he's very, very powerful, and he that's why he ranks right here at number 23. At number 22, we have Cthulhu. I mean, Cthon. Uh, no. In all seriousness, though, they look extremely similar. I have a picture of Cthulhu and then some pictures of Cthon. Um, Cthulhu and Cthon in monster form look almost exactly identical. Marvel barely got off. At first, I was getting onto Ben 10 for copying Marvel, but now I guess H.P. Lovecraft has to sue Marvel 2 for copying Cthulhu. Um, so essentially, Cthulhu has his monster form, and he has his normal Elder God form. He gives Scarlet Witch her powers, which is what allowed her to do that multiversal warp. He is the most powerful. That's it. He is the most powerful of all of the interdimensional demons and anything like that. Like... People say Sidorak versus Cthon. I just say Cthon because, to be honest, Sidorak was, um, when in one eighth of his power was like tanked by the Juggernaut in Galactus, and he had to like go into full power mode, but he was still beaten pretty bad. So like Cthon, on the other hand, although he started off as an Elder God, he wrote the Darkhold. Um, by the way, Agents of Shield. I don't think they covered that. He wrote the Darkhold, and that's the home of like all dark magic in the multiverse so he's just insanely powerful it was once stated that his mere existence was a threat to eternity so that's why he ranks in right here he's extremely powerful he is the most powerful of all the magic users in the entire marvel multiverse that's why he ranks in right here at number 22 so topping out part three today at number 21 we have chaos king now i know what you're thinking chaos king above the marquee of death and, and Cthulhu? Like, I know, it sounds crazy, but look at his feats, okay? He may not he may not seem all that powerful, but he did destroy 99.8% of the multiverse as we know it, and he was, Oblivion said that they were the same side of one coin, and he could not fight him. Although he was finally beaten at the last stand at Earth-616, the last universe in existence, they were able to beat him and shove him into a portal of pure blackness where he thought he absorbed the universe. And then Hercules draw in the heart of the universe, uh, not, not that heart of the universe, like the 616, like heart of the multi, and was able to rebirth everything and heal the multiverse. It, it was still, he was able to destroy that much. So it just... It doesn't really matter anymore, like, what what your powers are, or kind of what you've done. Like, he destroyed almost 100% of all existence. He was that close to being as powerful as Oblivion himself. So, like, even though Oblivion later states he was just a small aspect, I mean, it's true, but, I mean, you're an aspect of an infinite. Like, I don't know. Leave, leave a comment on what you think about this. But, um, yeah, so that's why I put him right here, topping off our list today at number 21. Thanks for watching that video. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you watched till the end. Did you like the list? Uh, tell me what you thought about it in the comment below. If you have any disagreements or if you want to talk to me about it, just leave a comment and I will get back to you. Um, thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe and to the channel, hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, and hit the notification bell so you'll be uploaded when part 4 drops.
which is tomorrow, by the way. Part four is where we get into the last section. We're getting people like the Cosmic Compass and the One Above All and all that stuff. It's going to be a ton of fun. So please stay tuned and, and uh, watch that video. It's going to be the finale of the series. And I think it's probably going to be one of the best episodes on this channel today. So um, on the right, you'll see um, Aki Dosta and Creep MC. Please subscribe to their two channels. They're good friends of mine, and they both have very different content. Creep MC does Fortnite and Minecraft tutorials, and Aki Dosta does anime paint openings. So if you could check them out, that'd be greatly appreciated. If you want to see part three, that'll be on the box to your left. And just subscribe to my channel. My icon's right there in the middle. I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.